Titration is used to determine the pKa of acidic protons on amino acids, which helps determine their charge in various pH conditions. I know, titration itself can be confusing, so amino acid titration seems like it would be even more confusing. But believe it or not, amino acid pKa in charge is easiest to understand on a titration curve. And I'm going to make it make more sense than you ever thought it could, which will help you easily know amino acid charge at any pH without having to memorize anything. But first, I have to say we highly recommend you watch our video, The Simplest Explanation of Titration, before watching this video, for a simple but full understanding of acid titration. The link is in the description below this video. But it's okay if you haven't watched it. Not only will you learn about amino acid charge in this video, you'll also learn a little about titration itself. So let's move on with that. Amino acids are generally considered acids, so their titration curves look like those of acid titration. I'm going to use glycine in this example because glycine is a diprotic amino acid, meaning it can have two acidic protons and all amino acids have at least two. So its titration is representative of most amino acids. And it's small enough to work in this video. But remember, all amino acids in natural and neutral conditions have a negative charge on the C-terminus and a positive charge on the N-terminus. For the titrant, I'm going to use the infamous sodium hydroxide, whereby the hydroxide is the base. And as base titrant is added, I'll show you exactly what happens with the amino acid during the titration and talk about pH changes and significant points along the titration curve. We'll start with two neutral amino acids, just as they're found in nature. Before beginning titration, an equivalent amount of acid is added to fully protonate the amino acids. For these two amino acids, two acids would be added. So before titration begins, all amino acids are positively charged. And in the case of glycine, in any amino acids like glycine, they are net positive one charge before titration begins. Then, to start titration, a precise amount of base titrant is added. In this example, one base compound. The hydroxide base readily reacts with the C-terminus proton first because it's the more acidic proton, extracting it and deprotonating the carboxylic acid, neutralizing the acidic proton into water and leaving behind a negatively charged carboxylate. This is the first half equivalence point, when half of the acid molecules in the beaker have been deprotonated at their C-termini. This is when protonated amino acid concentration equals conjugate base amino acid concentration. And using Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, when conjugate base concentration is equal to acid concentration, we get log of 1, which equals 0, leaving us with pH equals pKa. And because all amino acids are at least diprotic, and at the first half equivalence point, half the amino acid molecules in the beaker will have lost only one of their two protons, this is actually pKa1, which is the pH at which the C-terminus is deprotonated. And for all amino acids, pKa1 tends to be around pH of 2 to 3. Then, more base titrant is added to continue titration. And for this example, a second base compound is added. The hydroxide base readily reacts with the C-terminus proton of the remaining protonated amino acids, deprotonating their carboxylic acids, neutralizing the acidic protons into water, and resulting in the deprotonation of the C-termini of the full concentration of amino acids. This is the first equivalence point. The first equivalence point is when we can say amino acid concentration equals titrant base concentration, remembering that we started with two amino acids in the beaker and have added two titrant base compounds so far. First equivalence point for all amino acids except the basic ones is at the pH that indicates the pI of the amino acid, and pI is the isoelectric point, which is when the amino acid exists as a Zwitter ion, which is when it has a positive one charge at the N-terminus and a negative one charge at the C-terminus, making it net zero charged. Because equivalence point occurs around pH of 5 to 6 for most amino acids, except for basic and acidic amino acids, we tend to say most amino acids are neutral in neutral pH ranges, and our environment is generally neutral. So non-acidic and non-basic amino acids exist naturally as Zwitter ions. 
Also, since first equivalence point is when the amount of amino acid in the beaker equals the amount of base titrant added thus far, mole for mole, this is when the concentration of amino acid can be calculated using the equivalence formula, MV acid equals MV base. Then, to continue titration, more titrant base is added, and in this example, a third base compound, but this time, the hydroxide base extracts a proton from the N-terminus, neutralizing it into water, reaching the second half equivalence point. Notice that the positive charge was lost on the N-terminus, and the amino acid is now net negative 1 charged. Second half equivalence point, similar to the first half equivalence point, is where the concentration of partially protonated amino acid equals the concentration of conjugate base amino acid, which is in fact a fully deprotonated amino acid now. And just like before, at the first half equivalence point, using Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, when conjugate base concentration is equal to acid concentration, we get log of 1, and log of 1 is 0, leaving us with pH equals pKa. And because this is the second half equivalence point, and half the amino acid molecules in the beaker have lost their second proton, this is actually pKa2, which is the pH at which the N-terminus is deprotonated. And for all amino acids except the basic amino acids and tyrosine, pKa2 tends to be around pH of 9 to 10. Then, more base titrant is added to continue titration, and for this example, a fourth base compound. The hydroxide base extracts the proton from the N-terminus of the remaining protonated amino acids, neutralizing it into water, reaching the second equivalence point. The second equivalence point is not like the first. This is not an isoelectric point because the result is not Zwitter ions. The full concentration of amino acids in the beaker is now fully deprotonated, and they have a net negative 1 charge. This is pretty much the end point of amino acid titration, because if more base titrant is added, there's no more protons to extract from the amino acids, so the base just saturates the solution and makes it basic. I know that was a lot, but I'll summarize what you need to know about amino acid charge at different pHs. But before, I have to tell you about our publication, Everything You Didn't Know You Need to Know About Amino Acids and More to Score Higher on MCAT which has everything you need to know about amino acids for the MCAT with tons of practice passages and questions, detailed explanations with tips and tricks for other high-yield, high-trouble topics on MCAT, and answers to frequently asked questions. Plus, you get a comprehensive amino acid chart with everything you need to memorize as well as a blank one to fill in yourself. Links are in the description below. Now the amino acid titration summary. Before titration starts, the naturally occurring neutral amino acids are put in an acidic solution to fully protonate them, resulting in amino acids with a positive 1 charge. Then, titrant base is dripped in, which starts deprotonating the C-termini of the amino acids, resulting in half the amino acid concentration becoming deprotonated. This is the first half equivalence point, which is when half the amino acid concentration is still positive one charge, but the other half now has a zero charge. This is a buffer of protonated amino acid and its conjugate base, a perfect equilibrium of them. The pH at which half the equivalence point occurs is pKa1 of the amino acid. This is when a diprotic amino acid becomes net zero charge, and this applies to all diprotic amino acids, which is most of them. So whatever the pH is at pKa1 is the pH at which the amino acid is deprotonated at the C-terminus. The buffer persists until more titrant base is added, which deprotonates the C-termini of the other half of the amino acids, reaching the first equivalence point, which is when the full concentration of amino acids is now zero charged, meaning neutral, which are referred to as Zwitter ions. The pH at which the first equivalence point occurs for diprotic amino acids is the pI of the amino acid, its isoelectric point, when the full concentration of amino acids are Zwitter ions, meaning neutral. This is a significant point during amino acid titration. Then, more base titrant is added, which now starts deprotonating the N-termini of amino acids, reaching the second half equivalence point, which is when half the amino acid concentration is still protonated and zero charged, and the other half fully deprotonated at the N-termini and negative one charged. 
This is a second buffer region of protonated amino acid and its conjugate base, a perfect equilibrium again. The pH at which the second half equivalence point occurs is pKa2 of the amino acid. This is when a diprotic amino acid becomes negatively charged. And again, this applies to all diprotic amino acids, which is most of them. So whatever the pH is at pKa2 is the pH at which the amino acid is deprotonated at the end terminus. Once again, the buffer persists until more titrant base is added, which deprotonates the end termini of the other half of amino acids, reaching the second equivalence point, which is when the full concentration of amino acids is fully deprotonated and each negative one charged. The second equivalence point is not as significant as the first, except that the pH at which the second equivalence point occurs for diprotic amino acids is when the full concentration of amino acid is fully deprotonated, which really just marks the end point of titration, because when more titrant base is added, there's nothing left to deprotonate, so it just saturates the solution, making it more basic. I know that was still a lot to process, so here's a more important summary that will help you on test questions that ask for amino acid charge at different pHs, but I promise way briefer. Before pKa1, diprotic amino acids are positive 1 charged. At pKa1, diprotic amino acids become deprotonated at the C terminus, obtain a negative charge there, and become net zero charged, meaning neutral, their Zwitter ion form. At pKa2, diprotic amino acids become deprotonated at the end terminus, losing the positive charge there, and become net negative 1 charged. Notice that there are no more acidic protons on the amino acid, so after pKa2, nothing really happens, even if more titrant base is added. So, when diprotic amino acids are in pHs between their pKa1 and pKa2, they exist as Zwitter ions, net zero charged, meaning neutral, which makes sense because natural conditions are generally neutral, so an amino acid would naturally be neutral. And below pKa1, diprotic amino acids are positively charged, and above pKa2, diprotic amino acids are negatively charged. But these forms of amino acids are rare to find because natural conditions tend to be in neutral ranges, so we tend to find amino acids in neutral forms, which is between pKa1 and pKa2. Not sure which amino acids are diprotic of the 20 that you have to know for MCAT, for which this video directly applies? Well, it's all shown and summarized in our publication, Everything You Didn't Know You Need to Know About Amino Acids and More to Score Higher on the MCAT. Check it out. Links are in the description below. Simple as that.